Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizabram here with my co-host Andrew Keats, and um, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, an often requested uh, classic of the genre, and it is uh, if you're listening to this in real time, it's and you're in America, it's Thanksgiving, uh, it's Thanksgiving week. If you're listening to this some other time, or you're not in America, well, you know, just enjoy. Um, anyway, that would be the last waltz. Uh, Martin Scorsese, 1978, and we're joined by a very special guest, uh, another, none other than Tyrell Listen, uh, who is the host of uh, the uh, the podcast The Band, A History. So nobody could possibly be better to discuss uh, this film. <laughs> Say hi, Tyrell. Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. As my good friend Daniel Rohr, who directed Once for Brothers, once told me, I am the band historian, so everybody take note. <laughs> yes. I, I wanted to ask, and I, I apologize if this is a joke you've heard before. Did you consider calling it your show just the podcast? Yes. <laughs> I, you know, every name under the sun was considered. Um, I went with probably the most boring and most unimaginative name possible, just kind of to get to the, to the chase. But, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, as 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 Robbie and the boys taught us, there's there's no no points for creativity. It's fine. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I mean, in selecting names, everything else they mm-hmm. were very creative. Yeah, unless I'm, Andy, immensely. unless your position is they were not at all creative, <laughs> that would be a good. <laughs> that would be a hot take. This would be a spicy yeah. talk here. It'd be a, a uh, real, it'd be a real curveball from our <laughs> many other episodes of this show where we effusively praise the band um okay so um tyrell let's see let's just assume that um maybe somebody is not that familiar with the last waltz or hasn't seen it so Mm -hmm. for that uh person um and i i sort of uh if you're that person listening please like you're a lucky person because you get to see this movie for the first time but um tell us uh give us a little brief synopsis of who the band is and what Mm -hmm. the last waltz is yeah no problem so the band um were a group of Canadians and Americans, primarily Canadians, that were very pinnacle in establishing the genre that we now know as Americana. It's a label that we like to pin on everything that's not Mm kind of mainstream these days. (laughs) Uh, But uh, the band has a very lengthy history. Um, Most of them, again, from Canada, Levon from Arkansas, played behind rockabilly legend and godfather of Canadian rock music, Ronnie Hawkins, Rompin' Ronnie, Stompin' Ronnie, (laughs) whatever name you want to give him. Uh, Before, and probably more famously, backing Bob Dylan when he went electric um, for a short period of time. And then they went out on their own and established their own concoction of music. Uh, Like I said, Americana, Roots Rock, have you. Um, And they influenced a lot of their peers of the late 60s and early 70s to rethink what they were doing this was an era of heavy psychedelia and and acid rock and you have people from eric clapton rethinking about what he's doing with his career probably his life as well uh you have other folks like the beatles predominantly you know folks like george harrison really touting their praise uh and The Stones went back to basics. They were fans. Pretty much any influential musician of the era uh, really loved the band. And it it kind of changed the landscape a little bit. Um, And and The Last Waltz is kind of the expression of the late 70s in rock music. The excess and the burnout and the darkness that kind of consumed rock music during the era. And uh, as it's proposed in the film, the band was going to do what the Beatles did. They were going to become a studio act. They didn't want to be on the road anymore. They saw too many of their peers dying uh, from excess and touring and all of that. So they decided to assemble on American Thanksgiving Day, November 25th, 1976, to host a massive concert at the Winterland Ballroom in San Francisco with some of the biggest musicians of the day, including the likes of Ronnie Hawkins, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Dr. John, Joni Mitchell, etc. And it was filmed by Martin Scorsese, uh, now very famed filmmaker even then was definitely making a name for himself. And uh, it's kind of become the lasting 
testament of the band and who they were and the type of act they were and has been hailed by many as the greatest rock documentary of all times um so that's kind of an abridged synopsis of it but it you know it was complex it was lengthy uh the band was complex too so it's uh you know there's lots to be enjoyed there even if you're not a fan of the band if you like any of those other artists i mentioned or the list of other artists that appear in the film it's a great entry into their music yeah i mean i think for for a lot of people certainly i, I know for myself this is the entry into the band mm-hmm. and um you, you know a, a lot of songs that aren't the band songs b- based on the the version played in this movie sort of become the band songs become songs that you you uh you know associate with them forever and i think there's a, a like a, there's a new crop of 16 to 18 year olds every year who are discovering this movie for the first time as they put together what what is their their taste and their musical interests. So, um, Tyrell, what made you become the official uh, legally recognized expert on the band? <laughs> yes, uh, many many piece of paperwork uh lawyers the whole the whole the whole thing um no uh it it started out of a love like like everybody else i think you know as 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 a canadian i i always heard the band we have a thing here um with broadcasting CanCon, uh basically instituting that a certain percentage of all music played on the radio every hour is is canadian so the band obviously qualified as that so i heard in the background of my youth so- songs like the way i didn't like them I actually despised them um, just because I was an edgy teenager, you know, as, 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 as lots of folks are. Um, I discovered them later. You know, when I look back at it, it was, it was interesting. It was a couple of things. I saw Garth Hudson play live at a small folk festival in, in Southern Ontario. Uh, a friend of mine was in a community theater production of the story and life of Richard Manuel. And I had really uh, dived, uh, dove into the last waltz for the first time I was in film school and I took American cinema class, uh, which was primarily Martin Scorsese films and the last <laughs> waltz we watched. What else is so, there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Kundun, um, I liked it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wrote a paper on that one. Um, so all of those things led me to, as an aspiring filmmaker, I, you know, I started realizing that a lot of the folks that surrounded the band and everything still lived in Ontario. And I wanted to document this. Uh, One of the things that I, it's my personality. Once I like something and I started liking the band, I get obsessed with it to an unhealthy degree and I want to kind of explore it. And I had done some, some digging around and I started making a documentary on Richard Manuel, but I, I came up against a lot of, issues with legalities and stuff you know all the things that come with making a film and using music and everything um and i had read and i won't name the book but there was a relatively new band book out at the time and i was reading it and i just didn't like it because it was retreading a lot of the tropes and the narratives and the stuff that we've already heard a hundred times i'm like okay if you're gonna put out a book um please offer something new and highlight all of the members please because this was this was a unit so it was just around the christmas period and i was like okay i have some experience podcasting you know i've been trying to make this film screw that i'm gonna make a podcast about this i can do it all myself i you know i can lower overhead you know i don't have to involve people i can just work on this myself and the whole goal with that podcast was to explore the band explore all the members of the band and also explore the band post the last waltz as well so it started like three and a half years ago um and i've interviewed folks i've researched but at the end of the day it's an entertainment product somewhere along the line i realized this is a great band that kind of you know they're not the beatles they're not the stones in their stature or their commerciality but i think a lot of people would like their music so let me try to create a product in the podcast for people that are band fans already potentially new band fans or people that have been listening to their music for 30 40 years but don't know a lot about them so it's a little bit of of a show for everybody and that's how i became the official expert signed and sealed (laughs) (laughs) nice all right so then as the official expert we we can hop in the movie here in a second but sure we one one uh fascination david and i have had over the last year 
is um with the the lesser discussed axe at Woodstock ninety nine, mm-hmm. which has grown into uh, a, a deep fascination with Woodstock ninety four. And yeah, I would like to ask you, what are your thoughts on the bands, the you know the remaining members of the band? performance at woodstock 94 with i believe who else like some of hot tuna and bob weir mm-hmm. i believe was the the stage setup yeah i believe so i i'm i'm a fan of it um i think that just generally that period because the band obviously got, we got back together and they had their reunion years in 83 and, and intermittently and then they had more albums out in the 90s i think that 94 era the 96 was probably their peak of live performance since their you know golden era uh, and that 94 performance at Woodstock 94 is is awesome. I love Woodstock 94. Uh, it's weird. It's zany, but it's, it's interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like it too. The whole performance is on YouTube. Everybody go check yeah. it out. So uh, last waltz. So um, I think Andy and I have uh, thus far avoided uh, discussing this film. Well, you know, we've discussed it, you know, from time to time, but, you know, really getting into it. For two real reasons. One is, maybe we'll just kind of put this one aside, is like the eternal debate, is this a music documentary <clears throat> or is it a concert film? Which is sort of lame. And I think, you know, I don't know that we need to kick that one around too much more. Um, Andy, you know, feel free to jump in. But I think um, I think we've kind of established this as a documentary um, yeah. or worth talking about. And the other one is just the fact that like, you know, if somebody's making a list of the top whatever, any numeral, music documentaries of all time, no matter how small that number is, this documentary tends to appear on it and often like is considered number one or right up there. Um, and I feel like a little, I felt, I felt a little intimidated um, because it's like, okay, well um, you, you know, what, what, what is there to say that hasn't been said or what, you know, what's the approach on this? And um, so just kind of laying gotta my bring cards the out there. Yeah, yeah, you gotta bring the takes if you're gonna talk. Gotta bring something fresh. (laughs) I don't know if we're gonna do that or not, but uh, all we can do is bring our own, uh, the three of our kind of perspectives on it. But um, I just want to kind of start with like what Tyrell, like aside from just the band, which you're obviously a fan of, and like we said, the world's officially certified recognized expert. um, What, like, what do you think makes this special as a as a film, as a documentary, whatever? What stands out to you um, from that perspective? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple different categories that you can kind of put this in. I think let's talk about film as a as a as a medium. Um, yeah. There's lots of developments here, and I was aware of one in particular, kind of being the first film, concert film, documentary film of this style using 35 millimeter film. Primarily, 16 millimeter was used before because of technological disadvantage, overheating, which they suffered. Uh, on this film from as well. Um, I think the use of sound technology at the time uh, had only, a lot of it was established new for The Last Waltz um, or other films around that period, like Raiders and and other films uh, of that era. You had in the theater at the time, when people went in, the music would actually pan as the camera panned. And that had never really been done before. And the fidelity in which it was dispersed had never been really done before. So like on a technological side, there was a lot of innovation there, which I think makes it a worthy film to discuss. Um, On a cultural side, you know, I wasn't there. I wasn't born. But looking back at it and and looking at comments made then and now, because it's always tough with these things, too. It's like, okay, we know now what people say about it. But what were people saying about it at the time? And I think unanimously at the time, it was seen as something new. It was seen as something that was heralded and triumphant and in the film world, but also in the music world. I think the ability to take what a lot of people consider one of the greatest backing bands of all time in the band and then collect all of these legendary musicians and have it all kind of done on one night is just kind of crazy. That doesn't even really happen to the level of degree now. Like, sure, you have all these kind of variety shows where a bunch of people perform, but this was kind of different, and it was kind of one of the first of its kind, if not the first. And the way in which it was shot and everything, you wouldn't bring... A lot of people wouldn't have thought to bring in somebody like Martin Scorsese, one of the biggest up-and-coming directors, 
to make this movie. It's like coming today and you're a band and you're like, okay, I want to do something. I'm going to get like, who's the hottest director out right now? Like Jordan Peele, I'm going to get him to come in and do this. You know what I mean? I think there's a lot of first or experimentation that we now kind of take for granted because it's been done kind of ad nauseum now, but at the time it was really fresh and new. Well, I uh, just kind of getting into the, 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 the look of it. Cause you kind of mentioned the fact that it was shot on 35 millimeter. I mean, this is probably <laughs> the most beautiful uh, music documentary <laughs> um, just on that level. Uh, you know, if you turn, if you had to watch one music documentary with the sound off, <laughs> um, it, just to look at it, um, this is probably the one. And the thing about it is that I actually didn't even really realize until like looking into this is, um, Scorsese used basically three different cinematographers for this. Um, and I, I mean, Tyrell, I know you're a geek about this stuff. It's like I am as well, but, um, I mean, you have, uh, Michael Chapman, um, who was the cinematographer for Taxi Driver and The Last Waltz and Raging Bull. Um, you had um, Laszlo Kovacs, uh, who was the cinematographer for Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, uh, Paper Moon, <laughs> um, New York, New York, the uh, Scorsese movie, and Vilma Sigmund, who was the cinematographer for um, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. I mean, that's probably enough right there. Um, Long Goodbye, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Deer Hunter, Heaven's Gate, just like the best looking movies of all time. And having those three people filming your movie is like, uh, I mean, it's like having the three, you know, it's like having Garth, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, Levon Helm, Rick Danko and Richard Manuel be the singers in your band. Like it's impossible yeah. to have a, to name a band with like three better singers than that, you know, or pretty close to it. And uh, there's no way you're going to find a movie with three better cinematographers than that. Like, it's just like, the the one time that these th three geniuses all came together and once i realized that i was like oh that's why you know it's not just that martin scorsese did it and all these other things and you know there's plenty of other elements we can talk about but just from a a, a sheer visual richness it is mm -hmm. uh it's a real treat yeah and boris levin i think always deserves some credit too because boris levin is obviously he did the staging and the lighting and he's a legend of his craft basically touched every important movie in, in the early parts of, of cinematic history. Um, and I think I got a new appreciation of it again with the 4k remaster that was just done and released by criterion. It was just, you know, putting that on and seeing it in such clarity too. It's like this movie is just shot in a way, you know, and Scorsese's he's talked about it quite a bit and, and, and how everything was very planned and everything, but, yeah, you're right. It's just a beautiful spectacle in and of itself. And you don't even have to have sound, which you could argue is the most important part of it. And you'd still <laughs> just kind of be immersed in the film because it's just, you know, how he lights it, how how it's staged and everything like that. And so, David, didn't you you said you um, looked into the some of the, you know, how how Robbie and, and Scorsese ended up linking up for this, the the, the background on that? Yeah, I don't know a ton about it, but I I think my sense and uh, Tyrell, you can you know correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my sense is that like this was, uh, we can get into the controversy of uh you know the various members of the band and the Robbie you know conundrum which we've spoken about before, um but um <clears throat> my sense is that you know Robbie seems like he was the one who was really keyed into what was happening in film, and so um. You know, when the idea came along to to create um, a documentary about this concert, this like final concert they were doing, um, you know, he knew Mean Streets, um, you know, he, he knew Scorsese was like the up and coming guy. This probably I don't know exactly the timing because uh, this because Taxi Driver came out several months before this was shot. So I don't know if Taxi Driver had come out or was in production when he was hired, but it's around that time. I mean, this is clearly like the most up and coming you know, magnetic filmmaker on the planet. Um, and, you know, he was able to identify, okay, this is the person who I want to make my my film. And, um, yeah. you know, they've subsequently worked together for like the next, whatever, 50 years or something. Um, but I think their, their friendship and their working relationship was formed in the process of not just filming, but also editing this movie, which took, you know, some number of years. Is that about right, Tyrell? Yeah, I think the key point, 
uh, is actually Jonathan Taplin in that relationship in terms of Scorsese and, and Robbie getting together. So Jonathan Taplin, um, who's an amazing person. I did an interview with him. He's just a breath of fresh air. He, he was around Dylan for a little bit and then he became the road manager for, um, uh, the band and he produced mean streets. Um, that was his first oh. film that he ever produced and well done when tap. Yeah. So when Taplin got wind of this, that the band wanted to now document it, it, he was the connector there. He introduced um, Scorsese to Marty in a, a famous club in L.A. that I'm forgetting that obviously no longer exists. But they they kind of met up and had drinks. And yeah, Robbie, you know, a, a lot of the band were very film literate. And, you know, Robbie talks about in his book, him and him and Richard kind of when they first started going to New York, they'd go to the cinemas and watch stuff together. But Robbie was like particularly um impressed and engrossed by cinema and this film kind of you know for how great it is there wasn't any like really master plan ahead of time it was just going to be a concert and then it was going to be oh maybe we should film a little bit of it because it's the last time we're going to play live together uh, and we're going to just we'll just grab some like super or some 16 millimeter cameras and we'll just, you know, film it. And then it's like, okay, Martin Scorsese is on board. Let's, let's assemble a team. And it kind of just snowballed into this bigger thing. And I think none of them knew kind of what they were making until they kind of made it, you know? So, but yeah, Jonathan Taplin is kind of the great connector there. And I always like to give him a shout out because uh, he's very important in that whole story. Yeah. And so, the the we don't we don't need to belabor too much the the Robbie Robertson of it all but uh what the what what is the the actual case here with Levon's sort of notable lack of screen time uh, you know it, compared to his stature in the band you know he, I mean, obviously the performance is plenty of Levon but but you know his like first real featured interview doesn't come in until like halfway through it. Um, yeah. my understanding is he, he was just less into it. Um, is there, is there any, any more mm-hmm. to it than that? Um, yes, there's probably more to it, but I will say about Levon specifically, I will, I think it, I think that's one of the big criticisms of the film that it doesn't really yeah. highlight the unit as a whole. Um, yeah. but particularly with Levon who, you know, when you think about the band, it, it really is, it, it is Levon. It really yeah. is. So, you know, he should be there. Levon was very private. He didn't like photos. He didn't like interviews, at least early on. Um, he always bemoaned doing anything. Their famous cover on Time magazine. He didn't want to do that. You know, even the Elliot Landy photos, he didn't want to be in the, he didn't like that. He was just mm-hmm. like, what, what's all this crap? So um, I think he's at fault. In, in a large part, but then, you know, there's editing and there's positioning and there's motive and I don't know. And, and this isn't a bad thing necessarily, but Robbie's controlling this thing. Cool. He's going to put himself at the forefront. You know, who wouldn't, yeah. you know what I mean? He, he right. wants to kind of set up his next career as a movie star and like that, this is a perfect vehicle to do it. And he's going to focus on him. And you know what? He's like, I put the most amount of work in putting this film together. So I'm going to be at the front and center of this thing. So that's, yeah. I'd do the same. Well, and you know, it's funny because it's, that's such, that is the, you know, the most common criticism of this movie is that it's, it's the Robbie Robertson show, uh, which wasn't uh, an accurate depiction of what people loved about the band. And but yet it's not like it's hidden that 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 Robbie's like orchestrating this whole thing, you know, like our first interview, we have the you know, they leave it all in of Robbie saying, ask, ask me that again. And he, you know, he, he he tries his answer a second time. He stumbles over and says, you know, we we were together for 16 years. Oh, sh- should I say the band was together for 16 years? Like the it's it, it's it's interesting that the movie is is willing to show the the extent to which he is sort of a uh, part of the creative process here um yeah. and and just him not you know danko doesn't get anything like the like that right like richard manuel yeah. doesn't get moments where he gets to to redo his his uh, story time you know or something like mm-hmm. that they probably would have liked to i think that's the big yeah. criticism like 
for me personally, yeah, I think the interviews are a little contrived and yeah. sloppy, and it kind of yeah. takes away. But at the same time, I always have to put myself in the perspective. Like from a filmmaking standpoint, I don't, I don't like them that much either. But from an inner politicking of the band and everything, I have to always kind of take myself out of that because while I might know more about it, this is a movie for the average person. But that's a problem too because the average person who's now seeing this as the kind of definitive thing might have their view painted differently than I think maybe it should be. And that's just like, I think what the fans consistently go back and forth on. Right. Yeah. And it is what it is. Right. Right. I mean, I do think though that like what I'll say for the interviews and I, I really keyed in on this this time around, most of the stories that they tell aren't actually that good of stories. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like the, they're they're like as far as like road tales go, they're they're not the best ones I've ever heard in rock and roll history. It's a lot of oh, we could tell you some stories. Uh, you know, it's yeah, a lot exactly. of that kind of thing. Like, all right, well, tell me one. But yeah. I'll say that like you do kind of get the story of the band interspersed throughout these little things. Like, you you pick up like the 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 elements that they do contain. If you're if you're new to the band, you're gonna come away with a, like a pretty good understanding about like the broad strokes of of their career and who each of them were. So like, there's some sto- some like big picture storytelling in there that's um, considering how sparse the interviews are and like that that actually does do the job a little bit. Certainly. Yeah, I think the I think the uh, you know kind of um, sloppy i guess uh interview segments and the jumpy kind of piece with um with robbie in the beginning where it's like they're revealing hey this is a documentary you know um i mean that's so scorsese and i mean for people who've seen the rolling thunder you know the rolling scorsese's rolling thunder review uh bob dylan documentary or heard our podcast episode about that one um we know that he enjoys playing with the form of documentaries just as much as he does with uh narrative uh fiction films um and some people are gonna like that and some people aren't (laughs) that one uh is particularly controversial um you know i love it and i like when he's kind of pulling back the curtain and he's doing that kind of french new wave uh sort of thing where it's like oh but look this is a film you know like it's cute um i don't think that it in this movie is done too much um you know, there's a scene, which one, which, oh, it's uh, the, the, the song they perform um, with Emmylou Harris, Evangeline, where, um, so most of the concert footage in the movie is an actual, this is actual concert that they did. There's a couple of songs that are filmed as though it was a concert, but it's just on a soundstage. It was filmed afterwards, either for sound reason, they didn't capture it the way they wanted the film or for whatever reason. And um so it says he takes the opportunity when those happen to like really kind of play with it. And the, this one particular Evangeline, like at the end of it, like the camera reveals like the crew filming, yeah. you know, the, yeah. it, you know, the sound crew and the film crew and that get, or we just kind of like puts down their instruments and walks off stage. And this is in the middle of the con, you know, the, the documentary. And that just goes back to where they, you know, to continuing the narrative. So, um, you know, there's those little flourishes or touches. Um, and it gives you that kind of behind the scenes feel without it, you know, prim- most of the movie is just awesome concert footage. So you know, yeah. it doesn't detract in my mind from the real the real meat here. It's it's one of the coolest shots I think. That reveal is just kind of like that thing you're not expecting, but it's there, and you're like, holy crap, okay. Yeah. And I always also find it interesting how he in in the traditional concert setup, he never shows the crowd. He never right. really shows the audience, which he's talked about was a concerted choice because he's focusing on the performers um but like that was i think that was it was very unlike anything of the time too so he's making a lot of conscious choices here to play with the medium to kind of subvert expectation on certain things and you know he's the ultimate edge lord you know he's (laughs) really trying to throw it back at the audience (laughs) right i mean the the event that elon musk (laughs) Yeah, the the Evangeline one is so stylized that uh, I mean I I have to assume that 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 wasn't because of some problem with the the concert footage or the w- whether the sound or the footage I I have to assume that was his his intent. Yeah. So um, two of the, so some of the numbers were were 
done for sound. Um, that's and, but some of them were done because there were some weaknesses in, in what they saw because again they're also the, the the whole idea with the lineup of guests was to go through their musical history and some of their influences uh and they realized the staples the staple singers were one of the if not their biggest influence on harmony so it made sense to include them also they were they were like there's not enough black people in the film and yeah. that's kind of dishonest to our entire thing um so let's have the staples they did try uh evangeline during during the concert proper itself they didn't know the song they read it off of the lyrics right. off of cue cards you can listen to it on because it's included on i think some of the the re-released versions of the last waltz box sets it's not very good um, right. and it gave them an opportunity to uh show more of a country flair and emmy lou was getting big as a solo artist during this time and, and sh- sh- her and rick in particular had a good friendship rick actually did some work on one of her albums as well so there was some of that there as well uh and and to be honest they it came later too because they had to go back to the studio with a cut and be like hey we need more money for this and Uh. then they went to the mgm soundstage and and did some of those additional shots with the dry ice and and everything it's Mm -hmm. very stylized yeah yeah it's great it's great um and so so then the weight the 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 2002 album release of this movie includes the weight from the concert night mm-hmm. the movie however in, is soundstage of the weight um so I, i'm interested in going back and listening the 2002 album is is the one i grew up with i'm sure i've mm-hmm. that's like it's probably like the quintessential version of the weight to me <laughs> the one that is not mm-hmm. that does not appear in this movie um but you know to to your point that once he once he was on the soundstage he decided to pull out his bag of tricks and do do all do all the stuff he had I mean, you get a lot of it in the weight. I mean, that it's like very, it's it's like some some early Cohen Brothers stuff, um, like with the with the close in on on Levon. You were talking about David. Um, yeah, we there's a, like, it's yeah. I mean, it starts with like you know, it kind of it, it starts like showing Levon uh, playing. He's playing drums and singing the first uh, verse of the weight. Um, and Andy, I, I don't know if people are following along every time. Uh, you know the weight appears in a music documentary this is a drink you know I think, whatever i wanted um, to count i wanted to count today pro- I, easily I do number it. five or six um but <laughs> there you go tyrell um uh, <laughs> so um uh, <laughs> but yeah so it starts with the band and it moves in and like uh leave singing you know the first verse and then um you know when he starts to sing the first chorus like it just there's a real quick push in on him um and then it kind of moves around and you get this like hero shot um, of Mavis Staples singing the second verse, you know, picked up my bag, went looking for a place to hide. So like it starts behind her and you see her like um, Afro uh, silhouetted like a halo and turns around and sees her face. And then the third verse pop Staples is singing. So he's not revealed um, until the third verse, you know, even though they're all kind of standing in a line that the, the whole Staples uh, family. And um, you know, it's just, yeah, I, the 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 live version is great, um, and that probably you know would be cool to see that in a movie too, um, you know if if that existed. But um, it's so well done, and I think you could watch this movie, and if you're not paying like super close attention, it's done well enough where like there, it rewards close watching, but it it's still integrated enough that I think plenty of people I'm sure have watched this movie over the last forty whatever years and have would not have noticed that that was not actually a live footage yeah you know it's not so artificial that it calls attention to itself the way the evangelist reveal does the the other thing they leave in there is uh is is right when it's done uh mavis saying beautiful and and oh yeah you know, we, we love mavis uh, we're, mavis we're big best. mavis fans and yeah. like now this uh this was the first time i had watched it since we watched the 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 mavis documentary have you have you seen that movie tyrell it's on HBO. i have not have not seen it yet uh, I'm, I'm, I won't check it out it. it's it's, it's yeah. great but but uh it's so mavis the way she the way she <laughs> says beautiful after after spending time with her watching that movie it's it, it uh, just brings a huge smile to my face when she says it but and leaving it in there is almost it's like another version of like the you know the the, the stuff that's an easy cut that that, that he decides to keep mm-hmm so um let's go through the uh 
the the uh, I mean, you know, we we get probably interspersed in the movie. You know, half of uh, half of it is the the band just playing their own songs by themselves um, in this concert, which is great, and we could talk about that. But um, you know, I think the kind of th- memorable stuff that people remember are all the like all the guest stars. We've talked about a few of them, but um, I guess we should just kind of run them down. Um, yeah. So you know, the first one, which makes sense in terms of the sequence of the band's career. Um, and was also the first person to appear in the, so the sequence of what you see in the, the film is not the same order as what you get in the concert, but as what was actually happening in the concert, but here, like, okay, so Ronnie Hawkins comes out and does, who do you love? Um, yeah. And it's, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say about some of these, except like, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I know. You know, I mean, like this is, this is the thing I'm going to remember whenever great. I think of Ronnie Hawkins is yeah. this, mm-hmm. I mean, th- you know, this is it. This, this is part's star, so great. Cause it's just like, in, you know, the, Robbie or excuse me yeah Robbie had this idea of of telling the story of American music through this concert and, and having all the different components of American music represented but there's also like telling the story of the band and like seeing seeing the band up there with Ronnie like part of me feels like it's like this is still fundamentally who they are they're they're still these guys with with Ronnie up there pulling his hat off and waving off Rob, Robbie's guitar uh, mm-hmm. Levon was like, gets such a kick out of, out of Ronnie when Ronnie's going nuts. Um, it's, it, it, I don't know. I, it's, I mean, it, it, yes, it's, it's so good is probably the most, uh, uh, concise thing I can say about it. They just fall back into yeah. what they used to do when they were teenagers playing with Ronnie Hawkins. And it doesn't matter that now they're this big band and they are, you know, superstars in their own right. They feel completely comfortable working with the showman that is Ronnie Hawkins and playing behind them. And you're right. I like you touched something there. It's like this is still kind of who they are. I especially leave on. You know, like yes. this is him yes. to a T. Barroom blues. It's a little raunchy. It's a little fun. And you get that throughout his solo career. And it's just like this, you know any acrimony that they might have had why they split from ronnie and stuff it's like it doesn't matter you know what i mean yeah. we're just all great musicians we're getting up there and we're playing some of the best white blues that you could you could ever come up with right so, so maybe you could tell me what would what would ronnie hawkins stature have been like backstage with you know neil young and Joni mitchell would would they have would would they have known him? Would they have been excited to see him? Or, or would he, you know, sort of be off the map unless you were like a real the band head? Um, I don't. I can't say definitively. I don't think, to be honest, Ronnie Hawkins was that big. Um, mm-hmm. to some of the folks in the concert from the blues world specifically, like you know butterfield and, and muddy water and stuff and muddy like they probably know of him um but you know ronnie kind of left like he was he was down doing the thing around the same time as you know conway twitty and elvis and roy orbison and stuff and conway twitty actually told him to go up to canada because they paid more and you could play less um and he kind of settled into his role there as like a regional star in Canada and and that's kind of it he never reached that international claim or stature right so I, d- I don't know I do know that Ronnie would be rubbing shoulders with everybody though because that's just the type of person he was he would be <laughs> yeah. like you would know who Ronnie Hawkins was because he'd let you know who he was you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. yeah um the next guest who appears in the film everybody say it with me uh beat poet Michael McClure introducing <laughs> reading the introduction to the canterbury tales in chaucerian dialect <laughs> my speaking favorite of, part speaking of elements that are very rolling thunder reviewish is uh <laughs> is 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 bringing out poets in between the, the numbers yeah. yeah apparently there was yeah. a bunch of poets appeared at the day but he, in the film we get um michael mcclure and lawrence ferlinghetti who at least ferlinghetti is to this day a bigger name in that mm-hmm. world i guess um but um there, there are these two uh, poetry readings, uh, and and um, you know, I don't know how much there is to really say about that, but it's um, it's certainly an element that every single time I watch the movie, I'm like, oh yeah, this happens. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. it's it was a weird thing, like a cultural thing of that time. The Hell's Angels, the the 
they're activists. Emmett Grogan, who was also there, wrote a lot with Rick on his first solo album. Great writer as well. So yeah, it's just this weird kind of piece that clearly was for the audience because again, we had the whole Thanksgiving dinner and the waltzing and all that crap. And this is kind of just par for the course, but it kind of doesn't really make its way fully into the film. And it's kind of, a, it's there and you're like, okay, this is just some shit that they used to do in the seventies. Okay. You know what I <laughs> yeah, mean? I mean like, the rolling thunder yeah. review, they had that too. Yeah. So yeah. 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 I, that's one of the elements of a uh, big time concert going that you that didn't really uh didn't really stick. Um yeah. I guess I mean, I'm not knocking it. It's not I don't no. dislike it when it happens in the film. I'm like, "Oh yeah, this is kind of fun." But, you know, I'm also not so, hurting for it when I go to a concert. So our next got guest uh Mac Rabinac, the oh, doctor. Yeah. And so something that occurred to me this time, Dr. John is almost a more fascinating character as a young man. Than, than he is as as the old man that I've known him as my whole life. Because, like, it's closer to his origin, so it's harder to understand, like, where did he come from? Like, how yeah. how is he? <laughs> how, mm-hmm. like, at because by the 90s, when I knew Dr. John, it's like, well, he's just always been. He's He's been, he's that's Dr. John. He's been here forever. But, like, he's a young guy here, and it's like, mm-hmm. when did he start acting like this? When did he start being Dr. John? You know, it's, it's yeah. such a such a unique character when did he start talking that way he shows like i you know some people i i have talked to people that like enjoy the performance but they're they're not necessarily sure why you know what (laughs) i mean but i i think i think it makes sense in a lot of ways dr john like his whole new orleans like voodoo kind of myth mythic kind of proportion to him and everything very similar to the band in a lot of ways in terms of like their oddity you know and like strangeness um and the New Orleans blues funk thing, R and B thing, is very prevalent in the band's music. And Dr. Totally. John was also very tight and worked with uh, Alan Toussaint, who the band did as well. So I think it made sense. He kind of gives a rather understated performance in this film, however, compared to some of the costume kind of stuff that he did in his normal act. Um, but his piano playing is just so sharp and he just kind of gets that band in the pocket with him, And yes. it just is kind of marvelous. R- Rick, Rick seems, sounds so good in this. He's just, just sitting back and laying on that bass line. It's, mm-hmm. it's beautiful. I, I was listening to that part of it when, with headphones on, which I, I, you know, normally don't do that when I watch movies and man, Rick sounds beautiful in this. Um, yeah, I mean, please Lord. Uh, if you're up there, give us a Dr. John uh, or Dr. John, if you're up there, give us a Dr. John a documentary because uh, yes. seems like a fascinating dude, had a long career. Uh, those, especially those early albums with like I Walk on Gilded Splinters and all that stuff is just so good. Um, he just seemed to come out of the box um, as, you know, just immediately at fully formed um, yeah. and he committed to the bit like no other. And yeah. um, I've never hear Dr. John's music and fail to enjoy myself like it's just uh, there's no way there's no way you're having a bad time um another person who seems to be having a good time is our next guest mr neil young yeah good time yeah. all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean i guess we should this is like in terms of like the band is such a band that it's like defined by this like folklore around them this like mythic quality to them this movie has some of those and and neil young's uh backstage behaviors is is, is one of those um, the legend goes that um, he was using a lot of cocaine this evening and it was visible in one of his nostrils and they took it out frame by frame in post. Mm-hmm. Yes. That would Jonathan be the, the coke booger. That. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Taplin told me about that because uh, rotoscoping is what they did and it was very expensive and not done a lot at the time and they had to spend the money to do that. But it's their own fault. They had the nose room, as they called it. It was a white room decked out with noses as i was like an art piece and it was just cocaine everywhere and they're all just getting ravaged room. by the cocaine and uh neil just took it a little too far and uh he paid the price when it became part of this famous <laughs> this famous film but uh no neil neil has a you know i this is a hot take i don't really love his his appearance in the film personally but i i know i would get lambasted by a lot of people about that but it is what it I is. love it. I love it. I <laughs> now I, 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 you can also correct it. But my understanding is that this wasn't the, the song they do is helpless. But my understanding yep. is that wasn't even the song that was 
that they had planned. I don't, was it some other song? I don't remember. And then he just rolled out and was like, no, we're doing this one. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just, I mean, the band obviously could, that would, could hang. That would explain and, Robbie sort of directing the band at the start of it. And Neil says, uh, oh, they got it now, Robbie. They got it now, Robbie. Right. So if, they, if they were but, making I mean, changes on the fly, that would, that would, that would square. Helpless is e- mm-hmm. the the easiest song. I mean, it's three chords. It doesn't ever change. So if there's yep. a song you're just going to throw at nearly any halfway competent band, let alone the band, uh, there's yeah. no question they'd be able to get on get on that train real quick. Um, but the harmonies sound great. I mean, I, I it's one of my all time favorite songs. Um, and <clears throat> his enthusiasm and Joni backstage. Yeah. Oh well, that's the other thing. Is like I, I again, I always kind of forget is that. Um, once the harmonies kick in, you get like this silhouetted photo of Joni Mitchell backstage and you hadn't seen Joni Mitchell this far in the film, um, yeah. singing, kind of singing along. And it's I, like, was that happening at the time or was, I wasn't even sure if that was a later filming element that was added. Do you know? No, I believe that was filmed live with everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. It sounds right. I mean, the, the, they, you can tell they're singing harmony when they can't see each other. Cause there, there's a few times where it doesn't mm-hmm. match up well with, with Joni and Neil when they're when they're getting to through it Mm -hmm. um i'll say though that go ahead no go ahead go for it well i was just gonna say that uh neil's comment at the beginning when he first walks out and says it's one of the great pleasures of my life to be on stage with these people um that was like the the lasting impression for me in this movie when i was in high school and i saw it for the first time that was like you know it this was introduced to me as hey this is like one of the most important artifacts in in the history of rock and roll if you like classic rock you you should read and and like but when he says that is when it's it it drives home Mm -hmm. how important it is and how you know how honored everybody is just to be up there with these guys and just to be included in this night yeah and it speaks to like these guys a lot of these performers are bigger than the band yeah, you know, and the way in which they present themselves in awe of them or in gratitude of letting them, you know, yeah. perform with them to new fans is like, oh, there's something here that yeah. I'm missing out on that I need to get in on because like Neil Young's Neil Young, and right. if he's saying that this is a pleasure, maybe I need to explore it a little bit, you know? And you see that a few times throughout the film, right? With some of these, these huge stars of, of the day. And yeah. Uh, Clapton, I, I would say sort of has mm-hmm. a, a similar type of, of reverence for them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, Neil could certainly be a prickly guy. Um, look at his on and again, off again, frenemy relationship with CSNY and, you know, many other people in his career. <laughs> um, so, you know, when he says that, um, Neil does. Neil Young doesn't necessarily throw out praise that easily. Um, right. So the ne- we did the Staples singer. So ne- the next guest is, um, of course, the other Neil, uh, Neil Diamond. Um, uh, probably the in some ways uh, the most controversial um, uh, appearance in the film. I mean, two other people who we'll discuss later are controversial for other reasons. Um, but, <laughs> um, you know, Neil Diamond at just uh, kind of fitting into this uh, world of, of um, kind of uh, Americana-ish superstars um, sometimes has raised some questions. So, Tyrell, where do you land on this, on the Neil Diamond question, the eternal question? It's the, it's the perfect pee break in the middle of the film. Um, <laughs> yeah. And this was confirmed when I watched it at uh, Toronto's Hot Docs for an anniversary screening of it. And, you know, it's a theater full of people singing along and Neil Diamond comes on and everybody gets up and goes to the (laughs) washroom. Um, Listen, I think it's a bad song choice. I understand why they picked Dry Your Eyes. Robbie and him wrote it together. It's supposedly about Martin Luther King. It's off of Beautiful Noise, the album that Robbie produced that he plastered his name on front of, which is an odd choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a very kind of forced thing, but I understand it. Um, Neil Diamond and Robbie have shared a kinship together, I think. and And, you know, everybody's you're a band you kind of have to everybody's throwing in names who they want and maybe not everybody wants it you're gonna have to kind of go along i think there's been a lot made out of it as like a sticking point and there's other things about him and like bob kind of having a tiff behind stage and and like levon not liking him but levon also didn't like bob for a while either so it's Mm -hmm. not like levon liked everybody um 
so I think a lot's made out of it, but I think a, a, another thing is, is it just sticks out. Um, if, if we're going back to that point that you guys made about telling the history of like the band and American music, uh, well, I guess Neil definitely fits in with the, the, the American music and Robbie explains it. He explains the tin pan alley thing. He, he explains all of that. And I guess it fits in. It just feels forced. And this is during the Neil diamond, like Vegas era. It's not really him at his peak performance. Uh, in my opinion, he looks a little gaudy out there with his with his outfit and glasses choice. And he doesn't even seem that comfortable. He doesn't. No. It's not like, you know, the others seem like, oh, yeah, we're buddies backstage. Yeah. You know, we're doing blow together. We know each other. Neil doesn't really fit in with that crowd. He seems a little older than a lot of them, too. Um, and it just that's kind of where I think some of the. The issues come in for people. Yeah. Uh, so I'll say, first of all, th- th- what I just picked up on for the first time this in this viewing is that <laughs> as he's leaving the stage, Robbie says, Neil Diamond, great song. It ah, doesn't yeah. mention that he wrote the song. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Very T- typical funny. Robbie. Typical, typical, typical Robbie. Robbie. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, to, to put some meat on, you mentioned the, the, just the oft discussed tiff with, um, with Neil Diamond and Bob backstage. So the, the, the urban legend that I heard when I was a, a kid and I saw this movie was that uh, he, w- which is not actually what the urban legend is. With the one I had heard was that he walks off stage and said, "Good, l- good luck beating that." And uh, Bob Dylan said, "Why are you here?" <laughs> uh, the, which, which used to crack me up. Uh, but the much more, uh, more commonly told version of that is that Neil Diamond said, "Top that," and Dylan said, what do you want me to do? Go out there and go to sleep? <laughs> um, which uh, Rolling Stone asked Neil Diamond about in 2010. And Neil Diamond said that that did not happen. Um, he said what, what happened instead was that he, he actually initiated it. And it was before he went on. And that Dylan was, was getting, uh, getting ready, sitting down, not looking up. And Neil Diamond walked up to him and said, uh, Bob, those are actually my people out there. So look out, which sounds to me like just like an awkward interaction by a guy who was not very comfortable to be there and was trying to make conversation and ended up saying something that didn't really make any sense. Um, and he said that he thought that it noticeably bothered Dylan and that uh, he, he tried to try to get the exact quote. Um, he said. Um, that. You know, Bob, those are really my people out there. He looked at me quizzically. I said it as a joke, but I think it spurred him a little bit, and he gave a hell of a performance. It was a good night and ex- an exciting night. I was glad to be a part of it. So he, he goes ahead and takes credit for the quality of Bob Dylan's performance later that evening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to be the one to ride for Neil Diamond here. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this was... Uh, I I... First of all, I think it's very entertaining. Uh, I think he's an entertainer. And there's an element of the band, which is like, hey, we're here to put on a show. I mean, they're the band, right? And he's a putting on a show kind of guy. Uh, he gives his all. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't mail it in. Um, he's, you know, if he's, if he's uncomfortable, if it's not the right song choice, whatever, like, you know, this guy is the ultimate trooper. Um, and, yeah, it's kind of in, getting into his Vegas phase. I mean, it's like past the, like, Sweet Caroline, like, you know, whatever sh- Cracklin Rose, like early seventies, uh, singer songwriter era, but he's, he's evolving into, uh, the Jewish Elvis, which is what uh-huh. they called him. And, um, maybe it's nostalgia. Like, I mean, uh, Neil Diamond, um, just had a permanent place in like my mom's car when I was a kid, you know, growing up. And, you know, this was in the, you know, this was after the last waltz. This was like late seventies, eighties. Um, and you know, even, I I mean, I, you know, I, I've seen, uh, family members come home raving after Neil Diamond concerts, you know, that it was just like as good as seeing Elvis or, 
you know, anybody else you can name as just being one of the all time greats. I personally never saw him in concert. I would love to. I don't even know if he's still touring or whatever, but, uh, you know, I'm sure it'd be great. Although he's probably, you know, his capacity may be a little diminished at this point. Um, but, um, you know, I just don't know that I get the hate. <laughs> um, I don't think you guys have really hated on him. I think you guys have been fair. Um, but, you know, you just get like he becomes the punchline of the movie in terms of when people yeah. talk about it. And I think that's a little overstated. If you just, you know, if you came into this naive and just watched the movie, you didn't know any of these people. I don't know that you would immediately walk away and say, like, well, this guy was a total clown. Why was he there? I, I lay the blame on Robbie because I, I and everybody's like, oh, here we go, piling on Robbie. But to me, it's like, OK, he wanted to highlight the song that he wrote with 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 Neil. But to me, a lot of the earlier stuff, like the late 60s, early 70s, Neil Diamond actually fits in a lot better with the band. Like Brother Love's Traveling Salvation Show sure. is very much a band ish song. And if they perform that together, that might be one of the best performances in the movie because it's a killer song. And the band behind that and kind of elevating the instrumentation like they do with other people's numbers would have been awesome. So like, I feel bad for Neil in this too. And it also happens because he's continuously gets pile drived on because this movie is just watched every year by people. So it's just like, it's become a meme, you know, it's yeah. like, it's unavoidable at this fact at this point. Right. So, yeah, we'll start a campaign for Neil. There you go. So then you get the guys backstage having a little bit of a talk about the ladies of the road. Um, and it's a little, uh, with, and then, including getting the, chastised by Levon once. Yeah, they're, they're remind all. Remind everybody you know, that uh, you keep Richard it out Manuel, on the road. Richard Manuel is just talking about, you know, the ladies of the road and, um, you know, their various charms. And then Levon kind of goes like, guys, I thought we weren't supposed to talk about that, <laughs> and, which is just great. And then cut to, boom, <laughs> Joni Mitchell, <laughs> like the most dignified <laughs> person in this whole, you know, scene other than the staple singers that, you know, um, but, uh, you know, I, well, I always think you, I always find that a little awkward. Well, I think, you know, you, you missed a little bit of what the cut to is. It's not just a cut to Joni. It's a cut to Joni singing a road song. Right. She's, she's, you know, she's singing a song right. about uh, be, being a woman on the road. Yeah. Okay. And, and sure. Maybe the coyote is is the band. Maybe they're the the, the villains of this. The talk. It is a bit weird too because Joni and Robbie were really good friends. They travel yeah. like they they traveled and vacation together and everything like that. So probably not seen as a disrespecting piece, but in 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 hindsight it, it is a bit strange in, in some ways but there is that through line through the road song that's good um yeah it, it's a it's a marvelous performance i think you forget about it as soon as Joni starts kicking in but uh yeah yeah she's i mean th th this performance is great this is the the performance that like the band is the least uh involved in really it, i mean it's it's basically they really lay back and are, are just a backing band for for Joni mitchell doing her thing all of the other songs in some ways kind of become uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> accepting Neil Diamond, I guess, but everything else sort of becomes a, becomes a band song um, mm -hmm. where this sounds very much like anytime Joni was going to do Coyote. I think this is her doing too. I think she was kind of uncomfortable about having the band backer for whatever reason. There's mm -hmm. a lot of chording changes. Joni has her own specific style. I know Garth and, um, and um, John Simon had to, essentially transcribe it out and work with her to then teach the rest of the band the song and everything and they did rehearsals for this and Joni left the rehearsal the first day being like I don't know if this is going to work so mm -hmm. I think they kind of backed it up featured primarily Joni for for a couple of those reasons too interesting uh Paul Butterfield um now we get into the blues kind of section mm -hmm. here there's this like blues trio You've got uh, sort of a you got. Well, I mean, let's just talk about them all three together. You got Paul Butterfield mm -hmm. doing Mystery Train, which is, you know, uh, I mean, prim probably most well known as an Elvis song. So you get that kind of element. Then you get uh, Muddy Waters doing Manish Boy. And then you get, uh, of course, the peak of all blues artists further on up the road, Eric Clapton. Um, you uh, also get in. You also get wedged right in there. In my opinion, maybe the best of the interview segments. You get uh, Levon talking about the, you know, the the melting pot of the Mississippi Delta, and Scorsese says, "So what do you call it?" And Levon absolutely knocks, you know, it's a meatball down the middle, and he knocks it out of the park. What do you call it? Rock and roll. Roll. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so good. He's, he's, he's the so king of the himself. one-liners. Yeah, oh, he's, he's the king the... of the one-liners in this movie. Like the, you know, for all of the all of the shit he talked about the film and everything yeah. like this, he comes off looking amazing in this amazing. movie. He's the coolest. He's, he's the coolest by far the coolest. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and if you see the the documentary about his life, uh, I ain't in it for my health. He's on his deathbed and he's still knocking out one liners and still comes off as the absolute coolest. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, he, he just can't help it. He just can't help, but be charismatic and, and, and compelling. Uh, so the blues section. So, um, Paul Butterfield, uh, you know, well known for the Paul Butterfield blues band, uh, from the sixties. Um, just, I mean, those, I love those first few Paul Butterfield blues band albums, East West, um, it, you know, definitely a connection with Dylan and that whole crew. I'm not really clear exactly what the overlap was with Paul Butterfield and that crew with the band. Um, other than maybe they were just kind of mutual fans. Like, was there some kind of direct overlap that, you know? Yep. Yep. Albert Grossman managed Butterfield because Butterfield was uh, in the whole Chicago right. blues thing. That's where Grossman originated in, in, in clubs in, uh, Chicago, similar to kind of how you see it in inside Lewin Davis, how, uh, that the the character of Grossman, he's like in that kind of Chicago, right. cold Chicago club. That's that's where Grossman got his start. Managed Butterfield. Butterfield came out and lived in Woodstock for a while. He was kind of a debaucherous partier and animal, and kind of fit in with with the rest of the boys in the band during that era. So that's how they know each other. And and so he put must have Mike Bloomfield together with Bob Dylan um, mm-hmm. for the Highway sixty one um, stuff. Okay, so. Um, you know, I love his performance. I like Paul Butterfield. I think it's great. Um, you know, but then, I mean, of course you get Muddy Waters that, I mean, just (laughs) exactly what you want. You know what I mean? (laughs) And he's, uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's, I I don't know what you say about Muddy Waters. I don't, that hasn't been said. I I like, I really like watching, I really like watching Robbie play like true blues guitar off of, off of Muddy Waters. It seems like Robbie, the the student of American music, I think really comes across well here. He's deferential, obviously, um, but like kind of clearly geeking out. And also he really, he obviously gets it. He, he, you know, he knows how to, to tastefully play off of a legend. Um, I, th- I think, I think Robbie comes off really well and obviously Muddy Waters kills it. Yeah. It's Muddy. Like you can, you, so leave on and Muddy have a history. Mm-hmm. Uh, he they were involved on in the the Grammy winning album called Woodstock from 1975. Um, there's a huge respect there. Muddy's like the only guy that brings out other musicians because he's yes. Muddy Waters. He's like, okay, I'm right. bringing out Bob Margolin and I'm bringing out Pine Top Perkins. I'm like, that we're doing it my way. Um, and obviously, the, the it's it's part of one of the famous stories. He's commanding the stage. You have the one angle, which is Vilmos up in the wing, who took off his headset because he was tired of Marty telling him, turn off your camera, do this. He's like, screw it, I'm filming this. And he was the only one running. And they weren't supposed to be running any cameras during this performance, which, mm-hmm. is, which is criminal. Um, that's and insane. that's why you don't get the first cut until pretty much the end of the song when they reload the cameras but it doesn't need it it's like the perfect accident because it's like muddy's he's not moving around he's not kicking his feet up he's not he's just standing there and he has got a fist and he's just like hammering it through and he's old at this point i he didn't like he didn't live that much longer but he just like it doesn't matter he just out there does his thing and then walks off you know it's just yeah it is what it is yeah, and it is a change of pace because I mean the reason that was was because you know these these film cameras had you know the 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 film reel only lasted mm-hmm. so long so they had to be like reloaded and it was expensive and it was time consuming process so like you know they weren't going to stop the concert every you know after every song for like a long period of time to do re- they were just doing a concert so yeah. that's the reason why some of it wasn't captured um, and yeah I mean the choice to not be filming Muddy Waters piece was you know a, a whatever lane but it it does end up being a change of pace because you get these like very elaborately structured um you know uh blocking and way of filming um through most of the different performances and this one you just get one camera on this one you know guy and the people surrounding him um and and that makes it in some ways more compelling i think 
just because of the change of Agreed. pace and the different kind of vibe. And it's the it's the perfect example. It's the perfect person for that because he's not moving. He's just commanding the stage with his pure presence. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Eric Clapton comes out. And then Eric Clapton. Yeah. I'll, I don't know. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll take a bullet here. Look, the world hates Eric Clapton right now for for very good reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has not just recently. He has a, a long track record of of kind of being an asshole. He's given us many um, reasons to hate him over the years. And in some ways, Robbie absolutely shreds him in this movie. But that they're going back and forth. That the dueling guitar stuff here is good it's really good i i think i it, like no part of me when i watch this is thinking about how much i hate eric clapton the person i'm just falling back into it and enjoying you know quintessential 70s era rock god stuff mm-hmm. and i it's it's fine I, I think it's good i like it yeah it's again i think it helps the comfort of the band like this is their wheelhouse yeah it clapton wants to show up because he's like, this is my chance to play with the boys that I wanted to be in this band. This is my chance to be in the band. Um, you have that perfect movie moment when the strap falls off yeah. where the conspiracy theorist in me thinks it was pre-planned to make, to make like, look, if I'm Robbie, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Clapton's good. I'm going to fuck him up so I can, I can yeah. look like a king here. Obviously <laughs> rescue the song. That's it. Yeah. 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 That's just my like running kind of inner joke, but it is perfect interplay without a beat. You pick it up and it really just kind of shows everything. You know what I mean? That little moment, which a lot of people I think don't even realize it's just perfect. It it really is. And it's just a meat and potatoes blues number that they all just feel super comfortable in. And I think like we were talking about earlier, Robbie as a guitar player, probably a large part due to his own, um, way in which he frames himself is he's underrated he likes to be seen as a songwriter but his guitar work especially on the blues side is wonderful his stuff with john john hammond back in the day um some of those ronnie hawkins bootlegs i was just talking about the other day the the guitar work he does on java blues off of uh rick's first album it's some of the best guitar playing i've ever heard robbie is a stellar guitar player a lead player a soloist when he wants to be and this kind of shows that Stuff stuff from the '66 Dylan tour too. He's just yeah, incredible. Oh, yeah, it's incredible. He's yeah. just ripping it off. Uh, just yeah. like one, you know, one great soul after another. I think Eric Clapton. At this point, I love you know, I love the the Bluesbreaker stuff. I love Cream, um, and uh, you know, the Layla album. Uh, you know, I'm all there for that. Um, but I am just one of those people who thinks that around early '70s, Clapton took a turn and mm-hmm. just kind of settled into a kind of sound um maybe when he switched to playing stratocaster um and he you know he he he's very technically proficient at playing those types of blues riffs but it always sounds to me like starting around whatever 71 72 that he is just playing the same stock set of riffs over and over and over again he carries himself like i am a blues man he follows muddy waters in this concert <laughs> knowing what this concert is and it's being filmed like you think the guy would be like dude please let muddy play after me like i'm just gonna you know what i mean like have some have that kind of decency um <clears throat> and he you know it, it maybe he said maybe he begged and pleaded and they forced him to go out there after muddy waters i don't know but i just knowing what i know about him i doubt it <laughs> um it seems like he's perfectly comfortable being like yeah i'll you know let muddy waters open for me and I, that just, that stink comes off the film for me. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't skip it, but, um, mainly that's cause I like the part where his guitar strap falls off and then Robbie rescues the song and it's fun. Um, yeah. but I don't know, maybe I'm just, you know, whatever, maybe we're all going to love Eric Clapton at some point in the future and I'll eat my words. Um, hard to imagine doubt it. it going that way. <laughs> hard to imagine it going that way. I want to say real quick before we move on with the, some of the next guests, when they, they go to Shangri-La and, uh, and, um, Marty asks Rick, "So what that's are you their doing studio. now?" That's that's yeah. their studio. Just to be clear. yes, when they're, they're at their studio, and before Rick plays him uh, "Sip the Wing" the, from from his album, which I guess would have come out like a few months later, basically. But yeah, it came out December seventy seven, so roughly a year actually, roughly a year after it was filmed. Yeah, got it. Um, but when 
when when Marty asks him, so what are you doing right now? It's like so obvious there that like it's Robbie's decision to break up this band and to have the last waltz. And Rick is not cool with it. I mean, you know, maybe I'm reading a lot into that silence, but it's a prolonged silence. He puts his head down and he has a good answer. He can say, oh, I'm, I'm making music. I've got a, an, a really good album that's about to come out. But he, it doesn't seem like he's saying like, oh, I'm excited to get to work on my solo career. You, you bring up an interesting point because I think that the movie is built off of a lie. Yeah. And right. It's a lie that they all perpetuate full, full, fully knowing that they're telling it like, yes, it's, it's been document. Robbie broke, Robbie broke up the band. They didn't want to. And, and when they said, well, what if we continue without him? He apparently was quoted as saying like, you can try, but I'm not going to let you. Um, and Prior and around the time of the last waltz, Levon and Rick had already signed record deals. They signed record deals before the band was technically done. All of the press during that time is very confusing. The brand, the band isn't going on tour again, even though they, they say that they want to tour, but they're not going to. They're going to come back into the studio and make albums, but they're really, really happy making their own music. Rick is very happy to be in charge of his own songwriting and putting the band together being a band leader levon is as well again um but they're all still mentioning in all of these interviews oh yeah we're gonna get back together it's a lie it's a lie and that you know again it's really hard to as as somebody watching this net new it makes a lot of sense. It's like every other band during that era. Okay, we're going to break up. Okay, yeah. cool. But once you start digging in and you, then you start watching it through a different lens, you're like, is this some sort of denial? Is this some sort of lie just because we actually don't know what's happening? You know, what, there's a bunch of unanswered questions and sip the wine in that segment. It's great at telling us a bunch of different stuff about the dynamics of the band without actually even saying it, just the body language, just Rick sitting in that chair with his like tinted glasses and just like looking all cool, but sad and like introspective and playing sip the wine, which is an amazing composition. One of the best songs that he ever did himself could have been an amazing band song as well. It's just like, it's a perfect segment, but it, it, it leaves so much unsaid, but you can kind of fill in the blanks as you kind of are more engrossed in the band story. All right. And then we, so when we go to Emmy Lou, we already talked about her. Um, I don't know. And I we, feel like, you know, I kind of feel bad that we're skipping over so many of the band's own songs, but you know, there's so much to talk about here. And like, we, you know, we, yeah. we don't have like, you know, an endless amount of, uh, we're good. The 35 millimeter film reel that's filming us is going to run out eventually. So we, <laughs> we do hot. have to keep this yeah. moving. Yeah. It's getting hot in here. Um, yeah. uh, so, um, okay. So kind of, kind of closing in here. Um, perhaps the, the greatest dance performance ever committed to film uh, is, uh, and another, uh, let's say controversial character from time to time is, uh, Van Morrison comes out, um, to sing Caravan and, um, in my opinion crushes it and Absolutely it's awesome. It. <laughs> I mean, wait, is there, what are you going to say? Wait, is there, is there a dissenting view out there that, that Van Morrison doesn't crush it here? No, that's just simply my opinion. Okay. I'm not saying that yeah. anybody has a different opinion. Yeah, yeah. I'm speaking for myself here. All right. Great. Yeah, no, he kills it. He, he's in, incredible. And yeah. like, uh, there's another one. Like, their 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 reactions to him are really are are really funny. R- Rick seems to be having having a good laugh at at what a what a showman Van is. Yeah, it, the whole thing is, you know, Van didn't want to do it. He got scared. He went back to the hotel. Like, I don't know if the band knew this because they were out there performing. But like, Van almost didn't go out. He had come and done rehearsal. It sounded great. He also did tour allura with richard manuel which is also really remarkable it's not in the film but um the jumpsuit like that was a choice with like the wife beater underneath he's kind of frumpy at this point like my wife said she's like my my wife my wife grew up listening to van morrison and like her parents played it and she's like i saw him for the first time really in earnest in the last waltz and i'm like this is the guy that's singing those songs like what the <laughs> hell is this you know what i mean i was like that's the power of it he doesn't need the looks he's just a killer he goes out there and yeah. does his thing um 
the high kicks, like it is probably the what people kind of remember the most about this film. Van's just magnetic performance, an amazing voice. And it's it, it says something because you have a film of amazing voices, including the guys in the band. And you could argue that Van has the best kind of like vocal performance of the night from a performance aspect. Like he just comes out and knocks it out. And famously, there was a lull in the show and Van got the people excited after three hours of, of sitting there. Yeah. You know, this crowd sounds all selfish because like, come on guys, but yeah. Van came out and revived it. So that that's testament to his craft as well. It's so yeah. good. And then he he does that dance and like pieces out of the stage. He like literally he, you know drops I mean? the mic. Dro- dropping <laughs> yeah, the just, mic was not like to my knowledge a a, a, a term of art back in, in at the he, time of this movie. He invented he dropping quite the literally mic. drops the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just pieces out, stage left, gone. <laughs> Like they just yeah. watch him leave. They're like, okay, I guess we're yeah. wrapping it up. And Robbie just cues the band, like you know, the the because the the like the horns are playing with them at this point. The orchestra, and he just cues them all, like, okay, we're done. Boom, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's so good, just magnificent. And you know, he may be a controversial figure from time to time. Uh, I love the guy, and um, th- you know, uh, his, as a musician, uh, this is just a great, uh, you know. Again, you, you at the it's coming near the end of the film. You know, you could say like, well, why is this guy coming towards the end with all these other you know geniuses? And uh, there's really no doubt about it. But then, of course, um, you know, the finale, the goat, the man himself. Uh, you know, they, every time I watch this movie, I get excited from the first frame. the The movie starts with says uh, uh, a big title on the you know that says this film should be played loud. And so you're excited from the beginning, but I know, I know we're getting Bob at the end and, uh, boy, talking about delivering the goods. I don't like, there's so many different times that this could be true, but this is, is this like Bob at his coolest rocking this hat? He's so cool. He's got the hair, the hair, the long hair. Yeah. Yeah. Reddit disagrees. I saw this Reddit thread the other day saying, "Oh, this is this must be the weirdest Bob look." And I'm like, "You must be on crack. This is not <laughs> no the way. weirdest Bob look." You know what I no mean? Way. No way. It, it's a cool. It's a cool look. The white hat just kind of sells it to me. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of weird Bob looks. In the, in yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is right, uh, right around the time of the Rolling Thunder review, uh, or I guess it would have been right after the Rolling Thunder review if i'm getting my timeline right but it's well it would have to be because uh joni wrote coyote while on tour right right yeah yeah yeah, right okay so this is right but it's you know it's more or less that it like his hair had grown a little longer um he was not he was no longer wearing the white face makeup um yeah. you know and the scarves from the from the early uh from the first stage of the early rolling thunder review but um uh you know it's still kind of that um desire era bob uh kind of vibes and um yeah, they do Forever Young, which is a song, of course, he famously recorded with the band. Um, in you know, and and then uh, they do Baby Let Me Follow You Down, which I guess was a reprise, like it had been performed earlier, and then he just kind of brought it back. Like you can watch them all, you know, in typical Bob fashion. Like he doesn't really, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. Just like this may be the, toes, yeah. you know, imagine like you know you've been friends with these guys for more than ten years and colleagues and work with them. It's their biggest night. They're wrapping up they've got these film cameras and they've got this sold out show and blah 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 and it's coming to an end and you're not even gonna like let them pick what songs you're gonna do or the tempo or the key or anything like or let them know what you're gonna do <laughs> like you're just gonna do your bob dylan thing and like everybody's cool like nobody's complaining <laughs> no that's i mean that's that's the bargain that's you, you you signed a contract when you got in bed with bob you the inscrutability is part of the point uh all right tyrell what's your take on the on bob's uh bob's appearance bringing us all home here um i my favorite part of it is probably baby let me fall you down personally i i don't know i just love the energy of of that um i personally have a complicated relationship with bob dylan which i won't get into but i i think it's you can't have the film without bob you know what i mean like bob Bob is the rite of passage for the band. It, it's changing the band from uh, a great blues bar band. It helped them grow into what they became respected for. It's their, his toolage. It's his, his ability to teach them how to write, teach them you know, how to craft a song. Um, you need Bob. He needs to be the last guest. Um, it has to be this way. And 
he doesn't disappoint. Um, and look, he probably didn't feel it, obviously, because he's Bob Dylan. But if you're watching a film and you're starting to stack up all these guests, you're like, you better hope that he comes out and delivers the goods because, you know, we've had some great performances. He gets three songs. Um, I think the song choice is excellent. Uh, you know, I I think I Shall Be Released has a little to be desired in, in a few a few ways, but it is the perfect closing song choice. It makes sense. Um, but yeah, it may, you know, I don't, it can't, it couldn't have been done any differently. It, it makes sense to have Ronnie start it and Bob to end it and, yeah. you know, all the friends to fill it in the middle. Yeah. The I shall be released is like, you know, they bring out everybody pretty much like almost everybody mm-hmm. who's been on stage comes out to sing along. They also, you also get Ringo Starr as like the second drummer and Ronnie yeah. Wood playing guitar and you barely yeah. even really hear Ronnie Wood, but it's just like, okay, we also got a Beatle and a Rolling Stone. Um, yeah. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah. um, you get one really clean shot of Ringo's face. And like, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you're watching this for the first time and you go through, you're like, wait, was that, was that Ringo Starr? What just happened? Yeah. And there? he, he yeah. seems a little confused by what's happening as well. Yeah, he does seem confused as well. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's the, it is kind of, does kind of tell the story of music um, and, and the evolution of rock. Uh, and and the um, the overwrought nature of things, and it kind of points to the like massive sing-alongs that we would get in the '80s, like the "We Are the Worlds" and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. You know, do they know it's Christmas? Bob because Dil- and Bob and, Dylan's learning learning for what he's going to be part of in the future. These, yeah, these, these, these and the, telethon and, things and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, end uh, jam alongs they used to have when like everybody would get out you know Keith Richard be up there and you know everybody and um and they always suck because it's just like <laughs> you cannot have like 35 musicians on stage just being like hey we all know this song it's like three chords let's just play it and we're all just gonna sing and it's gonna be awesome like this is never good uh I mean this is not a bad version of that if there's that genre <laughs> uh, this isn't certainly is not the worst version of it but it is N- near the top frankly of yeah. that genre. Well, that's just a low that's a low bar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um because the the All-Star jams just never are as good as it uh, you know as you expect it to be. Um mm-hmm. but um but that's not quite the end of the film. The end then you get the um just the guys, the band playing the theme from the last waltz and Robbie's playing this like uh Gibson harp guitar which is like electric harp kind of. And it's it is a waltz, and it's kind of like an Italian y type of theme, I guess. And Tyrell, like, what do you know the like origin of this? Like, did is this just a piece Robbie wrote, or how did that? Yeah, be? so yeah, well, because it, Robbie, you know, into films and everything, he started dreaming up this last waltz theme. Um, he wrote he wrote a song to intro because you you hear it at the beginning of the film and you you see them lining up and you see the people waltzing and then at the end you get the the slow kind of zoom out or pan out and um it it it, it is reprised the album itself uh has the last waltz suite which i always highly recommend because it's a couple mm-hmm. different things they have a refrain where richard and robbie sing it together which is very interesting and they have songs like the well and out of the blue but yes it's kind of segmented by these two kind of uh or these two moments uh, where you have the waltz the last waltz theme which i think um which is cool you know it's just you get you get a sense of it though like because even back on their covers album moondog like they played theme from the third man and stuff like that like right, they like right, film yeah. music robbie liked film music and he wanted to take a stab at making his own iconic film theme you know so yeah, I mean, it sounds like it could have been a piece in a Fellini movie or, or you know, maybe a, a, an outtake from the uh, Godfather score. Like, that, you know, has that kind of a Italian yeah. film music uh, kind of a, a, a style. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that this piece has a life outside of this film um, or the soundtrack. You know, it's not like, uh, yeah. oh, we all, what's your favorite band song? Well, I like the night they, sold, <laughs> you know, the, the night they drove old Dixie down, uh, but really the last waltz theme is my jam, you know? Um, but it's, you know, it works. It's good. I don't know. Andy, last waltz theme. Yeah, I like it. You know, I went to a last waltz concert uh, about this time a year ago and uh, you like walk into the venue and they're playing the last waltz theme theme and you're like oh i know where i am i know what we're doing this all feels mm-hmm. right yeah it's just that motif you know that yeah. you kind of need it kind of wraps it up it, 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 but you're right it's not it's nothing special um but it's it's unique that's for sure yeah 
Well, we could kick this one around forever. Favorite moments, lines, quotes. There's like, you know, there, there's tons of this. Give me, give me one more, Tyrell. Give me, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Give us one more, uh, one more thing we haven't mentioned that, uh, about this movie that, uh, you always carry with you. Well, I, I don't think you, you can talk about The Last Waltz and not mention Levon Helm's performance of The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, um, the last time he performed that number ever. Um, and he doesn't do it with a whimper. He does it with a bang. Um, he also famously was the only one that didn't dub stuff in post. That is his real vocal. It wasn't dubbed. That is his real drumming. And he gives the performance of a lifetime. It is the definitive version, probably. Uh, I don't think you would ha- find many people dissenting that opinion. It is the best version of the night they drove old Dixie down. He just sings it with such conviction. It's the crown jewel of that film in a lot of ways. It's it's also quite telling in, you know, Once We're Brothers, uh, Daniel Rohr film a few years ago about Robbie. The movie ends with that segment from The Last Waltz. And in a mm. film about Robbie... This is the night they drove old Dixie down. It's like it is the definitive band moment in a lot of ways. So like you can, I would be remiss about not talking about that moment because I think it's probably, you know, I mean it's it is probably the highlight of the movie. I would say that yeah, that, that's the best performance. Uh, also, I'll, I'll I'll just add a nice little little breadcrumb here. We we get uh, Le Van Helm um, describing uh, the the origins of rock with the midnight rambles and uh mm-hmm. describing how the you know duck walk grew out of that and what what you know what the how, how a night would look like and at those sorts of things and then uh, years later towards the end of his life he starts putting on his own midnight rambles and uh at his at his house to start paying for for his medical bills some of that music if you go go find it it's really fantastic important lasting stuff and uh it's a nice little uh, it's a, it's a nice little call forward for, for what we're going to get later from Levon. Yeah, it's great. Um, all right. So Tyrell, uh, this is, there's gonna be no suspense here, but, um, we always end our podcast by asking, uh, <laughs> <laughs> seems like a pr- pr- t- pretty absurd question at this absurd point. For question. This movie. We always, yeah. we always ask, uh, if somebody's not like already a fan of the band or this film, uh, you know, they haven't seen it. Would you recommend this just as a movie to watch? Hey, what should I watch tonight? Would Would you recommend this movie? Yeah, I you know I recommend the movie. Um, I I you know I I have my own problems with it. I'm not I'm not even saying this as just like a complete homer for it. Um, I would actually probably recommend people listen to specific albums or even listen to Rock of Ages. I think that's actually probably the better live album in a lot of ways. Um, but I would recommend it if you're a film fan, if you're a documentary person. If you like Martin Scorsese, if you're just looking to kind of explore something that was important to cinema, the language of cinema as we know it, it's it's worth exploring. I don't think many people come out of it being like this was a waste of time or or anything like that. I think it's actually the opposite. I think most people I've showed it to plenty of friends that don't like this type of music, don't care about anything about this era, and they're like, "Wow, that was pretty good. Like that was that was interesting. I was engaged." And uh I think that's just telling of the craft of it so i i would recommend it yeah i'll add one thing we didn't we didn't really talk about much today is like it's just a very fun hang like yeah you know like it, the guys are like the chemistry on stage it's, it's hard to imagine how much animosity there was between these guys in the years after this because for what's on the film they look like they're having an absolute blast together they're playing off each other um, you, you know, Levon and, and Robbie are smiling at each other all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I, I think you know, I, I do play this all the, I watch this at Thanksgiving every year. Um, I've had in-laws that I've put it on in front of and no one has ever complained about this movie being on. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, put it on hangout type movie, uh, just the ultimate example of that. Uh, you can, you know, watch it. And like I said, you know, turn it off, turn off the sound and watch the cinematography and the editing and the filmmaking choices. Uh, you can uh, put it on the background and just kind of listen to it and just listen to wall to wall. Great music, especially Neil Diamond, but the rest of it's good, too. Um, <laughs> you can, um, you know, I, I, on any level. This is uh, just a blast. I mean, yeah, I can see how uh, from the context of, you um, 
uh, a, a recognized a world renowned scholar of the band there's complexity about the film and and it's um you know its role in the band's career but for somebody mm-hmm. who's not as as steeped and hasn't listened to every single episode of uh your uh, acclaimed podcast the band a history uh which everybody should um you know it, it i mean the film is just just a blast to watch it it just you know it just moves uh it sounds great it looks great it's you know if you if you have any interest in in music documentaries this is one to uh you know it's just ne- it it always delivers so um tyrell thank you so much for doing this uh the Band of History is the podcast where podcasts are found. You're at The Band Podcast on Twitter, so at The Band Podcast. Any other place where people should find you or whatever, look you up? No, just on yeah. just online everywhere, you know. The Twitter days might be numbered, but I'm on all the social media platforms, you know, Instagram, Facebook, not that they're much better, TikTok. Uh, love having chats. Love introducing new folks to the band um so definitely check that out and i just want to thank you both for allowing me to come on to talk about uh, any excuse to talk about the band last waltz <laughs> any of that uh, i i do it and i've enjoyed your podcast quite thoroughly and uh i got into filmmaking as a career because of rock docs like you know that's my favorite thing so you know thank you guys for doing the show and you're one of our guys on. <laughs> yeah <laughs> one of our people um well uh we appreciate that uh yeah thanks for listening to rock Docs people we are at rock Docs pod on twitter and i guess elsewhere and um yeah as uh in the words uh for one final quote of the immortal rick denko may he rest in peace uh happy thanksgiving that's right <laughs>